Hey everybody over at Oneness in Prayer and over at Under the Knaf and different places. So I am Julia Gibbs and I wanted to talk to you today about a holiday that you probably don't uh, celebrate very often as part of the Christian church, but that honestly is really important that we understand it. Um, I have no problem with still celebrating it. I think it's awesome because it's a great tool to teach your children and to allow your children to learn. But I want to talk to you today about the importance of Hanukkah. And often we can overlook how prophetic, hey Selena, <laughs> um, how prophetic the feast of Hanukkah or the festival, sorry, of Hanukkah actually is for the church and that we miss this great prophecy in it because we don't celebrate it. So I'm going to kind of spend a little time just showing you the prophecies and importance of Hanukkah. Oh, hey, Lucy. <laughs> um, how fun. So um, I love that y'all are all joining in and we get to be together to study some prophecy. It's awesome. I want to begin, though, with us looking at John chapter 9. So go ahead. No, John chapter 10. <laughs> my, my page flipped. Go ahead and flip there while I tell you some things. So here we go. Hanukkah, if you want to ask, where is it in the Bible? Well, technically, it's not in the Bible. Remember that last verse of Malachi that says, I'm going to send you the spirit of Elijah that will um, join the hearts of the fathers to the hearts of the children, right? And then there is silence, what we call silence, but technically the Bible is not silent on those years because the book of Daniel prophesied what would be happening often in those 400 years. So we have 400 years of what the church calls silence. Um, where no scripture is being actively written. And then you have the book of Matthew, right? You have the beginning when Christ comes and tabernacles with men, but it actually begins with John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah. Do you see the tie that was happening between the New Testament, uh, Old Testament ending and the beginning of the New Testament? So during those 400 years, what happened, right? a lot. And you can read fascinating histories on it. I'm going to be showing you a little bit of Josephus today. Josephus, um, for good or for bad, it's not Bible. He does lean on his own opinion sometimes in the histories, but he's a fascinating guy. You really should get his works and read what Josephus was writing as a historian, okay, not scripture at the time. But Josephus, records a story, as does Jewish um, writings that record of the book of Maccabees, technically, about something that occurred during this 400 years. And I'm going to break it down in just a second. But first, I want to give you a point of reference where we are. So in the book of Maccabees, okay, there something happens. The temple is taken over by a guy named Antioch Epiphanes, and um, they have to take it back. All right. And the taking back of the temple causes them to have eight days of purification. And that is where you get Hanukkah. It is a celebration. Hanukkah is a celebration of the taking back of the temple that, caught, that lasted for eight days of purifying the temple after things that have been done in the temple, which we're going to get to. And you see that um, this festival comes to me, be Hanukkah. Hanukkah is like a menorah. I mean, they use the menorah to light to light a candle each day. And if you recognize the menorah that we have in the temple in Exodus has seven candles. Well, this one has nine. And the implications of it, y'all, just be ready to be like, because it's so cool how it's prophetic that this one has nine. And the um, original one had seven. That is done on purpose. So where is Hanukkah actually mentioned in scripture. Go to John 10, 22. It is the only time Hanukkah is mentioned in the Old or New Testament because it happened during the 400 years um, of silence. And here it is, John 10, 22. At the time of the Feast of Dedication, circle the word dedication. Right there, that word is Hanukkah, all right? It means, anyone? Dedication, right? This is a um, prophecy 
of, um, sorry, this is a feast that celebrates the temple being rededicated, okay, after the purification, Hanukkah. And we see here in the book of John, Jesus has come to celebrate this very holiday. Don't miss that because we separate ourselves so far from it that we make Jesus a Gentile and he is celebrating all of these festivals. And if Jesus celebrated the festivals, should not we as believers take heed and know and understand what these festivals mean? Um, I'm going to say, yes, it's super important for us. And it's a shame that we don't integrate it more into um, our common Christian theology of the day. So here we go. At the time of the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? I want you to really underline what they're asking Jesus here, because it is super important to understand Hanukkah, to understand the prophecy of Hanukkah, to see what they're asking him. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, I don't know if he's that Southern. I'm sorry. He's probably not that Southern. I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they know me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. On this day, Jesus Christ stood in the temple at the Hanukkah festival, at the feast of Hanukkah, and declared that he was not only the son of God, but the Trinitarian being of I and the Father are one, and we know the Spirit is one as well. But the question that people were asking was, how long Will you keep us like this? How long, oh Christ, you know, until you tell us, do you come for us? And um, you can almost hear that in it. But they're saying, how long are you going to keep us in suspense, God? And y'all, this is the question of today, of right now, of people asking how long, right? And Jesus is saying, I have already told you, and I'm going to tell you. His answer to this question is written in this book. And it is as it is written in Jeremiah, as it is written in Daniel, in the latter days, it will come about and you will start to understand it. We are living in the days right now where, um, oh, similar to Daniel, when he read Jeremiah and figured out 70 years we will be in captivity and then we are leaving. We are living in these days right now. And so right now, as this question comes from the church, how long? do we have? How much longer will this keep going? How much longer until you reveal yourself as the Christ? Is it true? Is the words written in this book really true? I mean, this is what is happening today. We're standing asking these questions. And the Lord says, I told you, you don't believe. Y'all, that convicts me to my core. Because he's not just point, he's not pointing fingers to people outside that don't believe. Y'all, he is talking to us. He is talking to the Pharisees of the day, the Sadducees of the day, the people of the day. And he is talking to us, the church of today, saying, I've already told you, but you, I mean, I almost can hear the words like, you don't read the book. And when you do read it, you barely believe it. And the parts you do believe, you throw out the things you don't believe. And it's a whole system together. And so you see at Hanukkah, they asked Jesus if he was really God. And he told him, oh, I am the true God. Because Hanukkah is a prophecy. Hanukkah and Purim are the only two festivals celebrated by the Jews that have Antichrist. Um, involved. Both of those, don't miss this and write it down in your stuff. 
both Hanukkah and Purim deal with the Antichrist, or the better word for that, honestly, is pseudo-Christ. Um, John is the only one in the Bible that uses the word Antichrist, and he's talking about an Antichrist spirit that is with us today. Um, you see it all the time. But when we are talking about the Antichrist, we use that terminology, right, for the lawless one, for the one with the big mouth. There's, um, you know, several names for him. And I just want you to hear that Jesus proclaims himself the true God at the time when they're celebrating a feast of dedication, a celebrating and remembering when an antichrist entered the temple, declared himself God, and people went along with it, except for a remnant. You see, the prophecy here is Jesus. He didn't pick this day by accident. Everything the Holy Spirit does is on time, on purpose. He stood on that day to declare himself. And more than that, what did he say? Those that are mine, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will be snatched from my hand. Y'all, everything on my body is standing up. This is the promise to the overcomers. This is the book of Revelation over and over and over. If you will overcome, if you will not conform, if you will stay by my word, if you will stay in me, abide in me, I will let nothing take you from me. You can hear this and you will reach eternal life. Revelation 22. So let's go quickly and look at the history because you have to understand this to get the full message of what um, the Holy Spirit is telling us. I told you that, so I put John 20, um, 10, 22 at the top to give us a reference point in the New Testament where Jesus is pointing out this is important. Don't miss it. Okay. Antioch Epiphanes is the first, this is all referring, let me back up because I get excited. This is all referring to Daniel 9, 27, the abomination. You see a, where did I write it for you? Of desolation. I wrote it up there somewhere. The abomination of desolation. Read um, Daniel 9, 27, which is the 70 weeks of the end of time. And Matthew 24, 15, Jesus himself will say, um, that is the key. Actually, let's go there. I just need to read that to you. So go to Matthew 24. All right. He lists all these things, signs of the end of the age. And often we list these up. Oh, this is going to be um, the things that happen at the end. But actually, he says this is going to start building and this is birth pangs, but it's not the end. The thing that switches the um, catalyst or whatever you want to call it that sends you to the sign that's like, oh, something's happening is this thing in chapter 2415. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Y'all, when the Bible is even telling you, come on, you got to get this. This is important. You need to underline that and we need to heed the message. Then let those who are in Judea go to the mountain. So I, I'm not going to keep going on that. I just want you to give you a reference. Jesus himself refers to Daniel A as a prophet and B as the prophecy of the end times, the abomination of desolation. This happened. If you were Jewish, I explained it to my kids this morning. If you were Jewish and you're listening to Jesus, you're going to go, hmm? Because that had already happened 168 years before Christ had come the first, what they called the abomination of desolation had occurred. That is what Hanukkah is about. You see, the first abomination of desolation happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. If you remember in the book of Daniel, if you don't, it's okay, stay with me. <laughs> but if you remember, there were all these prophecies about what would come next. Greece would come, the um, Mede Persian Empire would come, and then Greece would come, and then Rome would come, right? The statue, remember the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Well, um, in there, he prophesied to a T, so much so that scholars really struggle, and they're like, Daniel had to be written hundreds of years later. There is no way a man that early in history could have gotten it so correct. And I want to tell you, that man didn't, but the Holy Spirit fully knew what was coming. 
So from outside of time, God tells us in the book of Daniel that there would come four winds from um, Alexander the Great, and those are his four generals, and that the earth would be split up among them. One, I'm not going to get into all those generals, but one of them was the um, Seleucus line. Okay, so just remember the Seleucus line. He was a general. They, he got Israel. That's the piece of land that he got. He got a, a big span, but but Jerusalem, Israel is included in that. And he has a son blah, 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 down named Antioch Epiphanes, who is now in charge. Antioch Epiphanes' name literally means. God manifest among us. He named himself this. He is calling himself God among us. Does it sound familiar? Maybe like Emmanuel? You see, this Antichrist spirit takes on the names of God and calls himself God and puts himself in that position. And this is in 168 BC. But don't miss how amazing the prophecy is that's happening in here. So he comes in and what does he do? Okay, I have the book of Maccabees here. And I just wanna, I'm sorry, this is Josephus, not the book of Maccabees. He says that Antioch Epiphanes comes in and these are the things he does. He comes in and takes the city, Jerusalem, by a great army and slew a great multitude of those that favored Ptolemy. That's the other generally, the general, the Ptolemaic line. If you're like, I have no clue who Ptolemy is, you do, but you don't know it. Her name is? Cleopatra, the last of the Ptolemaic line, okay? So in your head, and sent out his soldiers to plunder them without mercy. He spoiled the temple and put to the constant, it put an end to the constant practice of daily sacrifice. For how long? For an expi, expi I can't read today, for three years and six months. How long is that? Three and a half years. Remember over and over, 1,296 days or 90 days, over and over in the Bible, it's talking about this three and a half year period. And then another three and a half year period makes up the seven years of tribulation, right? And so we've got the same time, the three and a half years, they are not allowed to, um, the word becomes, I'm just going to summarize some of what he writes, writes here. The word becomes illegal. They start burning the Torahs. You're not allowed to read it. You're not allowed to worship that. He requires a oneness in people, calling it unity. Hear this, calling it unity. He requires all oneness that you will worship the same God for they will be one people. And so it gives no room for the word of God. This is what the Antichrist spirit does. He will replace himself, it says in the Bible, over all gods, Allah, everyone, any Hindu gods, Buddhist gods, even though they say they're not a religion, they are. Um, but he replaces himself over everything. And that is prophesied of the Antichrist. He will put himself over all gods, little g, right? And so he comes in and he says, if you don't conform, I will put you to death. So now we have, it is not only illegal to read the word of God, you can see the progression. And honestly, it's like you can just look at Germany's history in a 10 year span. Hitler went from sitting in prisons to being the dictator of the country. And he totally used this exact same plan, which is the anti-Christ spirit, a slowly boiling pot concept of just making little things illegal, little things illegal. Y'all, this is happening. This is occurring in our nation today. So next you have this amazing thing. He not only goes into the Holy of Holies, he goes in and brings a statue, a massive idol. Remember, what is the prophecy in Revelation? He is going to set up an idol of the image, right, um, in the temple that is yet to be built. And so here you have that happen. It is the idol of Zeus, which is the head god for them. It is the, you know, head god, which is indirect, if you want to say, um, fight against God, Yahweh, saying, no, this God is the real God. And so here you have the idol of Zeus. And I want to just point out something weird about Zeus. He was known to be a very big womanizer, but one woman particularly, which is important because of the prophecy of the book of Revelation, is that he went 
dressed as a bull. He, he changed himself as a bull. He's like the ultimate X-Men, I guess. And he goes to this woman, Europa. And he slowly, she's afraid of him at first, but he's kind to her. So one day she'll pet him. One day she brings a flower and put, puts a wreath of flowers over him, giving him honor, right? And then finally, finally, he convinces a woman to ride a beast. This should sound familiar. Revelation 17, the woman who rides the beast. Also, look at Ezekiel 28. For the girl in Greek mythology was from the city of Tyre, or Tyre, T-Y-R-E, and her name was Europa. It is where we get the name of Europe. And interesting enough, Daniel's Nebuchadnezzar statue says that out of Europe, i.e. Rome, the Antichrist will rise. And you, so you have a woman connected to this idol put in there of riding the beast who, hear this again, it was slow and deliberate. One day, just pet him. Just allow a little bit in. One day, honor him. You know, just put the wreath around his head. This is how this is going to go. If you are, if we deceive ourselves enough to think that, boom, this horrible, awful person is going to be here and government system, and we're going to be like, that is shocking. I cannot believe that occurred. That is not how this is going to occur. The Bible is in patterns over and over telling us it is going to be a slow boiling pot and it is working. There is an antichrist prepared, I believe, in every generation, for Satan does not know this, the time or date that he will be needed. That is why you get people like Stalin and Lenin and Hitler and Genghis Khan. You, can, you name so many of them. So let's keep going. So then, oh, in Ezekiel 28, you just, you got to look at it because it's, it's the Trinitary, what we call the unholy Trinity. It shows you Satan, and then it shows you the Antichrist, and then it shows you, oddly enough, it switches to a female, which I, oh, we'll get into that later, but maybe it's the woman who rides the beast. Okay. But she's um, the daughter of Sidon, the sister city to Tyre. So let's go to sacrifice. Finally. This is what Antioch Epiphanes does. That kind of is the end for the Jews. They can't take it. He compelled the Jews to dissolve the laws of their country. So no longer should you follow the word of God. Dissolve the laws of the country. And to keep their infants uncircumcised. No longer will I honor the covenant with God. And the word is compelled. It's fascinating. And to sacrifice swine's flesh upon the altar. The final straw that Antioch Epiphanes does at Hanukkah is that he brings what God has said is unclean and he calls it holy and he puts it upon the altar. The altar that soon will have the blood of Jesus Christ dripping down it. That altar he puts upon a swine, a pig's blood that God has specifically said is unclean and unholy. Y'all, this is what we are dealing with today. What we call, and I'm just going to call, I'm going to tell you right now, abortion is one of these because it is the most unholy thing to murder babies children in the womb, and yet we call it holy. We call it choice. We call it good. And the Lord, I believe, is sick over what we are calling holy when we know in the depths of us that it is unholy and it is unclean before the Lord. It is sin. So you can see how the progression occurred. Quickly, so that's the first time. And remember, I want us to really remember that, um, and so, no, I should finish this real fast. So the Maccabean revolt comes, these great men and their names like Matt, Matthias and John and Simon, sound familiar? <laughs> um, very similar names to um, the 12 disciples, but they, they say no more. And they cleanse, and they, um, it's an amazing story. You can hear about it in, the, in Josephus' work. I mean, Antioch Epiphanes comes at them with everything they've got, even elephants. That would be very similar to, if you remember in World War II, the um, Poles 
knew that um, Hitler was coming in in 1939. Remember that begins the war, and they and no one was going to help them. The entire war had um, world had abandoned Poland, and they famously met tanks and machine guns of the Nazis on horseback and swords, and they died and were slaughtered on the field for they believed that it was better to die free than to die and to die free for what they believed in than to just simply give over where so many other countries that's exactly what they did when Hitler showed up because I can't fight this so they just gave in where Poland said no we'll we'll just die Y'all, that, that has to be the heartbeat of the church. We have to be willing to die for truth than to live for falsehood, for the lie of Satan. And so that the Maccabean revolt comes in and Hanukkah is born because you'd see they, they get in the temple and it's been totally disgusting. It's had pig's blood on it and it's had this idol of Zeus in there. And they've been doing disgusting things when you read the histories, like having orgies inside the temple of God and all of this stuff. Yo, if you believe this is far away from us, please just look at the state of the church today and the things that we allow inside the house of God or even your own body. You are the temple of God and the things we allow ourselves to do as Christians. And the Lord is saying, I have said these things are unholy. Why do you allow them as if they are good? And so you have Hanukkah, eight days of purifying. Those Maccabean sons come in and become priests, and they must purify the temple. And so it takes the eight days of Hanukkah. But you see, Hanukkah has nine candles on it, eight days for the cleansing. But the candle in the middle, you see the big one? Its name is the Shamash candle, okay? I want to tell you the name of the candle is called the servant candle. It's amazing. It is that candle that is lifted and lights every other candle on there. I just want you to remember that and start thinking in your head the servant candle, the Shamash. And so they spend eight days purifying it. Let's jump back, though, in history really quickly. So that's the first time. This is when Hanukkah is born. And yet Jesus, when he comes and he talks in Matthew 24, 15, he's referring to something that the Jews would have been so confused about. They would have been saying, that's already happened. And yet Jesus is saying, no, it's going to happen. And so he's going to be prophesying in the future about something that they're like, that was 168 years ago, right? Um, or confused Jesus. Well, a hundred years after the Maccabean revolt, when they take back and for a hundred years, they have the land again of Israel. A hundred years later, a guy named, Ty sorry, no, Ptolemy takes over a hundred years later. Um, yeah, I wanted to point that out. Um, the Maccabees hold it for a hundred years, but then Pompey, a Roman comes in and he takes it from them. And Pompey is the guy who makes it Rome. So when you have Jesus coming in and it is Rome that is in charge of Israel, that's where that happened. But now let's fast forward. Jesus has died and now we're in 70 AD. Rome, who got it from the Maccabeans, Rome is now led by a man named Titus in 70 AD. Okay. This is the second happening of what we're going to call Hanukkah, okay? Because he does the ninth of Av again. He does the same thing. He puts foreign gods of Zeus again. You see that again um, in, in there. And he um, has all of these extremely similarities to the first time. Like so similar that you cannot say this is not on purpose. You know what I mean? Like when you get so many parallels, you're like, this is completely God. He's telling us a picture. And in 70 AD, that starts Israel's diaspora, or diaspora, sorry. And the diaspora will last from 70 AD until 1948, when Israel gets their land back, all right? So you can see this is the second time. When I was in Israel, I got to see what they call Titus, Titus's arch of victory. It's amazing. It's this massive piece. And go look it up online. 
and you stand under it and you see the menorahs and the gold cups and he was celebrating just taking everything from the temple and just tearing everything down and he had this trump this massive arch of triumph built in israel and then a couple years later i went to rome and right by the Colosseum. for those of you who have been to rome please remember this and go look if you're going to rome go look on the, if you're facing the Colosseum on the right hand side, there is a massive Trump um, um, arc of triumph again. And what it is, if you go stand underneath it, you're like, this is about Israel. You see, he had two built matching ones. One stands in Israel and one stands in Rome. And go look him up online if you're not going to Rome. But you stand under there and you realize this is real. This really happened. Like you see him with the menorahs, you see all the soldiers going in, the gold cups, the tearing down of the, of his, and he was celebrating what he did to the temple and to the people of God because Titus considered himself to be God. He was an antichrist spirit and it is him who levels um, Israel. And actually he raises Jerusalem to the ground. The word raise is opposite from what we say. It means he burned it to pieces. There is nothing left um, at that point. So that's the second time. But you see all of prophecy in the Bible, we've talked about this a lot. Remember prophecy, all of the Bible is written by a Trinitarian God in a Trinitarian time frame. Prophecy always happens Trinitarian. You can see it once, twice, three times. And each time it is a halfway or partway um, revealing of the full prophecy. You see, each time that this happened, some of the things that were in the book of Daniel happened, but not all. Okay. Um, I, I, in my mind, I think of it like an excavator digging in the earth. You get a little bit, but you haven't gotten everything. Second time you get even more, but not everything. Third time it gets it all. And that is the difference in Western and Eastern thought of the Bible. You see Jews see prophecy as pattern, not a call and response as we in the Western world with Christianity do. We think it's, this is said, this happens, right? But if we do that, we misunderstand prophecy and we miss so much. Um, there is a belief system that Titus was what Jesus was the only thing Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24 or 15, and it's called preterism. It means it was happened then and it's over and nothing of revelation is to come. It was all about that. That does not make sense when you do the timeline and you see the Bible as Genesis to Revelation and you put all the prophecies together for a complete look at what's happening. So not, neither one of these completely match everything. So we know, as you look at Hanukkah, we know as believers that there is more to come and the abomination of desolation is still to come in its full tea. But that this gives us the pattern to understand how it happened, why it happened, the sequence of events. Y'all, this is laying it out for us so that Jesus is saying um, in John, you should know, I told you. And I believe for the church, we're at that point, I've told you, read your Bible, study it and study him like it is silver and gold. So let's go really quickly to um, flip over to Zechariah 4. And I want to show you this vision about the menorah, the lampstands, and why this is so important for Christians today to not only know it, to celebrate it and to teach it to your children. Please don't miss teaching this to your children. So we said it's eight days. That is really significant. Let's start there. Eight days is what we're waiting for. I don't know if you realized it. Seven days of creation, seven days of man. We are waiting for the eighth day, the new day that starts in Revelation 22, right? And um, actually, sorry, it starts in Revelation 20. That is called millennial reign. That is what we wait for. Revelation 22 doesn't have a day because time is done by then. So we're not defined by the Yom, the 24 hour day. And so Revelation 20 is the millennial reign when Christ is literally with us. He takes here, he has the seed of David. He comes back as Mashiach David, whereas the first time he came back as Mashiach Yosef. Remember, the Jews were looking for a Messiah who would be both Mashiach Yosef, 
Messiah Joseph, and Mashiach David, Messiah David. They were looking for both. And that's why they kept asking Jesus, like, are you going to take back our land now? Are you going to give us Israel back and kick the Romans out? And he's like, you don't, you don't understand because he didn't understand the timeline. Actually in the book of Luke, it says that this Titus coming, why did it happen? It says in the book of Luke, Jesus stands and weeps at Jerusalem and says, it will be laid to waste. And he's weeping when he sees it, when he's, he's crying, the, the disciples can't see what he's seeing. He's watching Titus and he's saying, if you only knew the time of my coming, if you knew the season, they missed it because they didn't understand the first time Jesus would come, he came as the servant, the suffering servant, Mashiach, Yosef. Joseph's entire life is a prophecy of the first coming of Christ. And that is the candle that is in the middle of the Hanukkah menorah because he is the servant candle that came to lay upon that um, cross, to spread his arms up, to be lifted up high so that, as John 7 says, I can give you the spirit of God, the fire of flames. I put myself upon the cross to light in you the very Holy Spirit of God so that you become the temple of God, so that you will not grow weary. You will not lose out. You will not be snatched from my hand, but your light will continue until the eighth day, and it will be a miraculous saving. When Jesus was on the cross, he, it says that he died. And our Bibles often um, translate the Greek to say, and when he died, he gave up his spirit. Well, in the Greek, it actually says he gave up the spirit. Hear that. The moment Christ died, the spirit was released to come upon the earth. It's amazing. And that's the prophecy here. The Antichrist prophecies of Hanukkah, I already showed you so many. And the woman who rides the beast is even in here of Revelation 17. Then we get to purification. Purification had to happen for eight days. But how did they purify? They had to purify with mixing water with the ashes from the red heifer. Hebrews 10, 14 says there's been one sacrifice for all time now. No longer do we have to sacrifice because Jesus Christ was the red heifer from Numbers 19. Go study the red heifer of 19 and realize everything that happened to Jesus was prophesied right there when God told them how to find the red heifer. To this day, hear this. The Jews have not, since Christ, found another red heifer that matches Numbers 19. Because it's so specific what it has to look like that never since then has there been born one. And the answer to the Jews is because it was Jesus Christ that was the red heifer. So you see here that the water had to be mixed with the red heifer. What does 1 John say about the water? I'm just going to flip there and I'll read it to you. This is 1 John 5, 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these all agree. You see, they had to mix the water. The spirit of God, who testifies to Jesus Christ, had to be mixed with the blood of the red heifer, the very blood of God himself, who came to tabernacle with men, who came to die at Christmas time. And it had to be mixed. And for eight days, purification had to happen. And how was the miracle performed? Because the oil and the lamp never dried up. Because the servant candle in the middle was lighting them on fire one by one day, by one day. And the oil of the lamp, oil is the Holy Spirit always, never burned out. That is the promise of Hanukkah. It is the promise of scripture. It is the promise of God. These things written will never burn 
out. They will complete, as Jesus said, every letter of the law to the crossing of the T, to the dotting of the I will be fulfilled. Nothing in here will be missed because the Holy Spirit, by the light of Jesus Christ, will keep it going until it is finished and we are in millennial reign. But quickly, go with me to Zechariah 4. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was wakened out of his sleep. I love that vision that, um, that it's showing us right here. He is asleep, but he is woken in the spirit while he's asleep. So he said to him, what do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a menorah. If your Bible says lampstand there, it is menorah all of gold with a bowl on the top of it, seven lamps on it with seven lips, seven times seven. That's the 490 years, the 70 times 70. Um, you hear that a lot, go research it of Daniel nine, it's amazing. On each lamp that are the top of it, and there on it were two olive trees, one on the right and one on the bowl and the other of these. And the angel said to the Lord, do you know what these are? And I said, nope, all right, <laughs> I can imagine being like, I'm, I'm pretty confused right now. So he says, no. And the angel talked to me. Sorry, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay. Right here, we have the menorah. So the Hanukkah one has this extra red line. I wrote it in red so you could see. The regular menorah, the temple, only has six on each side and the seventh in the middle. We will see this menorah again at Revelation 1.11, Jesus is standing in the midst of the menorah, the lampstand, the word is menorah, being the seven churches. So not only is Israel represented in this seven, it is pulled through to the book of Revelation, and now the church is represented by the menorah as well, the seven churches. But you see here, he's going to say to Zerubbabel, who... Um, at this time in history, they've gone back to create to build the temple after the Babylonians um, leveled the temple. So this is way before Hanukkah. And you're going to see that here you have um, two olive trees standing on each side. And I want to give you the picture of what's going on here. The olive trees, if you jump down and read, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord for the whole earth. And the two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden altar is poured, the olive trees are standing on each side, pouring in the oil, pouring in the oil so that the light will not go out in the temple. Remember, that's about Hanukkah. The light doesn't go out. Well, if you jump to Revelation 11, this is in the book of Revelation. This is a direct tie. Here we go. Um, you'll have Revelation 11, 4. These are the two olive trees. You see, it, it, it's not mincing words. He's telling you from the thing of Zechariah, here we go. Here are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Remember this verse in Zechariah 4, um, 13, 14. These are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord before the earth. He sends back who I believe is Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, the word of God and those who bring the word of God to man. He sends them back for three and a half years during the tribulation time. They will be teaching truth against the lie of Satan that will be taught by the Antichrist. And so right here with the menorah, you have these two, the law and the prophets, standing after the church has been removed from the rapture, standing upon the earth, preaching for three and a half years against the lie of Satan and filling, continuing for the Jews to fill them with oil because oil is the Holy Spirit. Remember when you were anointed with oil in the Old Testament, what did it bring? The Spirit of God poured out upon you. And so they are going to be standing the very oil from not are they making oil, they are the olive trees because the law and the prophets are the olive trees of God. Ah, stop it. Don't call me. <laughs> and you're going to see here how they're pouring in. It is the word of God, the law of God, the prophets of God, the prophecy that is speaking, that is pouring in the very spirit of God upon them and anointing them so that they may speak against the Antichrist and Satan and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. 
So Zechariah 4 says to Zerubbabel, and this is, I'll close with this. I know I've gone long, but it's just amazing what's in here. So Zechariah is standing, seeing the menorah that will bring to the end times. Don't miss that. The menorah that will bring to the end times. And he's standing there and he's talking, saying, tell this to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the one that went back after Cyrus. And because they were not allowed to have a king, he is from the king of David. He became the governor who was building the temple of God. Okay. I scratched myself. So um, Zerubbabel, Zechariah, the prophet, gets a word to bring to Zerubbabel. What is it? He's saying to Zerubbabel, who's having so many issues building. Okay. They become lazy. They get off course. Um, the enemy is against them. Um, people hate them. They're just tearing them down. And then they're having internal fighting. It's a mess. Go read um, Ezra and Nehemiah. And he says to Zerubbabel, not by might. I just want, I want to stop and just hear this. If you are continuing, this, the thing that Hanukkah is telling you is this verse. Not by might. Your strength man's strength cannot save you. You cannot do enough. You cannot fix enough. We cannot expect others to do or be enough to save us. Not by might, nor by power. There is no authority on earth. It does not matter what authority it is. If it is a government, if it's principalities, there is no authority on earth that can save you but by my spirit. This is the message of Hanukkah. When you light these candles, when you remember that it's the promise, that even though know for certain, as he said to Abraham, when he gave him the covenant, know for certain, this is coming a third time. Know for certain that what I speak is absolutely true, but you will know because you are my people for certain that your light will not burn out for it is not your spirit. It is not your, sorry. It is not your might. It is not your power. It is only by the spirit of God, the oil that is keeping the lights burning, who Jesus himself, the shamash candle will lift and light every single one. It is only by that, that you will have eternal life and that you will see him again and the millennial reign. That's the promise of Hanukkah. So I hope this is kind of whet your appetite to go look at Hanukkah more and even more all of the festivals. But um, we just realized that we should not be espoused from the Jewish festivals. And people in the church constantly saying, that's Jewish, why should we care? Because Jesus said, you should know. When they said to him the question in John um, of, hey, how long? What's the suspense? What are you going to tell us? He said, I've already told you. Church, God has already told us the answer that we seek. And he's telling us that for this season that is coming, it is written in the book. Study it like it is silver and gold and hear the voice of God that is revealing to us how this is going to come, how this is going to happen, that the patterns are already there, but that we, the church, are to listen as Zerubbabel did and that we are to build the kingdom, not by our own might, not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that is indwelling in you because you are one of the candles. And when he lights you and you are on fire for Jesus Christ, you can't help but become a shamash candle yourself. You go, you start lighting other people. You start setting the church on fire with the Holy Spirit of God and that you, like Christ, take on his image and you are called to be a shamash yourself. So thanks for listening today. Um, I'm just going to close this in prayer. Lord, I just thank you. Thank you that you are not leaving us without answers. Thank you that you are speaking right now. And I pray that every single person listening to this will be just anointed by the Holy Spirit. Let fire burn up your back. You are called to walk in your gifts. 
If it is a gift, take hold of it. For the Lord is saying, it is time to raise up. It's time to rise up, O church. It is time to take your place. And it is time to just stand on the promises of God that this is truth. But his promise is, if you stay, if you abide, if you are mine and you know me and the Father, you will not run out of oil. I just hear him saying right now, remember the virgins, the 10 virgins that ran out of oil. This is Hanukkah. The five experienced the miracle of Hanukkah, but five of them did not. Oh, church, live in the the, uh, message of Hanukkah. Celebrate today and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen.